The Suez Canal is an important transport artery connecting the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. Initially opened in 1869, the Suez Canal was jointly owned by France and Egypt. But in 1875 the Egyptian government, which was experiencing great difficulties in paying off its debt obligations, was forced to sell its stake in the canal to the British Empire. From that moment on, the canal, which was located on Egyptian territory, did not bring any income to the Egyptian government. In the 20th century, the Suez Canal became even more important as it began to be used to transport oil from the Persian Gulf to Europe. After the First World War, Egypt, which until the collapse of the Ottoman Empire was legally considered part of it, was under the rule of the British Empire, although from 1922 it received nominal independence. In 1936, Britain agreed to give Egypt full independence, on the condition that British troops remain in the canal zone until 1956. This agreement was observed until 1951, when Nahas Pasha came to power in Egypt, who immediately annulled it. After that, skirmishes broke out between Egyptian police and British soldiers in the canal zone. The situation became very tense and fearing that the British would realize their threats and occupy Cairo, King Farouk of Egypt was forced to leave Nahas Pasha to resign. However, already in the summer of 1952, the King of Egypt was overthrown, and the state itself was proclaimed a republic headed by Abdel Nasser, in whose hands was full power. Britain immediately began negotiations on the future of the Suez Canal with the new Egyptian authorities. The result of these negotiations was an agreement signed on October 19, 1954, according to which, by the summer of 1956, British troops were to be withdrawn from Egypt, but military bases in the canal zone were to be preserved so that if there was a danger to navigation, the British army could return. Also, the Egyptian government pledged not to interfere with free navigation through the canal. Relations between Egypt and Britain soon deteriorated, as in 1955 the British government refused to sell weapons to the Egyptian army, which led Egypt to conclude an arms supply agreement with the Soviet Union. The rapprochement between Egypt and the Soviet Union, of course, did not please the United Kingdom and the United States, which, in order to put pressure on the Egyptian government, refused to finance the construction of the Aswan Dam. Since the platinum needed to be built one way or another, the Egyptian government decided to nationalize the Suez Canal, and use the income received from its operation to finance the construction of the dam. On June 26, 1956, the Egyptian government nationalized the Suez Canal, and despite the fact that compensation for the value of the shares was guaranteed at the price of their last quote, France and the United Kingdom, of course, could not come to terms with the loss of control over the canal. It should also be mentioned that, having nationalized the canal, the Egyptian authorities stopped letting Israeli ships through it. France and the United Kingdom planned to regain control of the canal by military force. To put their plans into practice, the Allies decided to bring Israel to their side, which was experiencing serious difficulties both because of Egypt's refusal to let Israeli ships through the Suez Canal, and because of the blockade of the Strait of Tehran. In addition, even after the end of the First Arab-Israeli War, Israel was preparing to continue the confrontation with the Arab states. On October 22, 1956, in the city of Sevra, a secret agreement was concluded between France, Israel and the United Kingdom on joint actions against Egypt. According to the plan drawn up, the Israeli army was to launch an offensive in the Sinai Peninsula and reach the vicinity of the Suez Canal. At that moment, France and the United Kingdom were to intervene in the war in order to establish control over the Suez Canal under the pretext of dividing the belligerents. Before the start of active hostilities, the Israeli army had a grouping of 100,000 soldiers, and the United Kingdom and France prepared 45 and 34,000 soldiers for the landing, respectively. As for the army of Egypt, its strength ranged from 70 to 300,000 soldiers. It is important to mention that the Egyptian government assumed that France and the United Kingdom would try to establish control over the canal, so most of the Egyptian army was concentrated in its vicinity.
On October 28, 1956, when members of the Egyptian general staff were returning from Syria on an IL-14 aircraft. In the sky over the Mediterranean Sea, an Egyptian aircraft was shot down by an Israeli fighter, as a result of which the Egyptian army lost a significant part of the highest military command. On October 29, the Israeli army launched Operation Kadesh. At 3 p.m., Israeli aircraft launched a massive attack on the positions of the Egyptian army in the Sinai Peninsula. At the same time, 400 Israeli paratroopers landed in the eastern part of the Mitla Pass and, having established control over the Jebel Haitan Pass, took up defense. At the same time, the 202nd Parachute Brigade of the Israeli army under the command of Colonel Sharon advanced to the Mitla Pass. In the southern part of the Sinai Peninsula, the Israeli 9th Infantry Brigade, thanks to a swift attack, managed to capture the city of Ras al nakab which they planned to use as a springboard for an attack on Sharm el-Sheikh. On the same day, the 4th Infantry Brigade of the Israeli army was able to establish control over the city of al qasimah planning to continue the offensive towards the city of Abu Uwayla. By the morning of October 30th, Sharon's detachments united with the paratroopers who had landed earlier and jointly attacked the positions of the Egyptian army near the Jebel Haitan Pass. The 4th Armored Division came to the aid of the defending Egyptian detachments, but by this time the Israeli paratroopers had managed to take an important height, which allowed them to repulse the Egyptian counterattack. Under the cover of night, the Israeli army units managed to establish control over all the important heights in the vicinity of the Jebel Haitan Pass. In turn, the Egyptian army was in a vulnerable position because of which it was forced to retreat. On the afternoon of October 30th, Israeli detachments, supported by tanks, attacked the Egyptian defensive positions in the vicinity of Abu Uwayla. This attack was unsuccessful and the Israeli army, having suffered losses, was forced to retreat. Meanwhile, Israeli detachments were able to bypass the positions of the Egyptians from the south and attack them, but despite attacks from two directions, the Egyptian army held its positions. The Israeli detachments were forced to retreat in order to regroup to continue the attack. At this time, the positions of the Egyptian army in the vicinity of Abu Uwayla were attacked by Israeli aircraft. Resuming the offensive after an air attack, the Israeli army managed to establish control over the city of Abu Uwayla, after which, developing the offensive, it attacked Am Katef with air support. The Egyptian garrison managed to repulse all the attacks of the Israeli army, but due to a lack of ammunition, the Egyptian command on November 1 decided to retreat from Am Katef. Also on November 1, the Israeli army, with the support of aviation and tanks, attacked the positions of the Egyptian army in the Gaza city area. Despite the resistance of the local garrison, already on November 2, the city fell into the hands of the Israeli army. By November 4, the advancing detachments of the Israeli army were able to block the city of Sharm el-Sheikh from two sides, after which the Israeli army began a massive shelling of enemy positions in the city. Israeli aircraft delivered napalm strikes against enemy positions, Already in the morning, the Egyptian garrison of Sharm el-Sheikh capitulated and the city fell into the hands of the Israeli army. As early as October 30th, the United Kingdom and France sent ultimatums to Egypt and Israel, demanding that they stop the fighting. Of course, the ultimatums were not fulfilled, and on October 31st, the aviation of the United Kingdom and France attacked the positions of the Egyptian army in the vicinity of the Suez Canal. In response to the bombardment, the Egyptian government sank 40 ships in the canal, thus completely blocking the passage of ships through it. Despite the fact that the probability of an invasion of the Anglo-French troops was very high, the Egyptian command from the first days of the war began to transfer forces to the Sinai Peninsula planning to defeat the Israeli army, but by the evening of October 31st, the Egyptian military command, having correctly assessed the situation, began to transfer troops from the Sinai Peninsulas around the canal. On the night of November 1, Anglo-French aviation carried out a night bombardment of Cairo, which, however, turned out to be ineffective. Nevertheless, Allied air attacks continued, and by the evening of November 1, she managed to destroy most of the Egyptian aviation both in the air and at base airfields. On the morning of November 5, British troops landed at the El Hamel airfield and took up defense in its vicinity. After the landing of additional forces, British detachments, with the support of aviation, began to move towards Port Said and soon reached its environs. 
Meanwhile, French troops landed on the southern outskirts of Port Said. Being squeezed from both sides by the British and French paratroopers, the Egyptian garrison began negotiations on surrender, but it was not possible to agree on acceptable terms. On November 6, Allied Marines landed in Port Said, which made it possible to begin a full-fledged assault on the city. Supported by tanks, the Allies attacked the city from three directions. Very soon, fierce street fighting began in the city, realizing that it was impossible to quickly establish control over Port Said on the evening of November 6, Allied tanks, supported by infantry, began to move towards El Kantara, but the Allies failed to establish full control over Port Said, as well as over the Suez Canal. The fact is that even in the first days of the war, the Soviet Union began to threaten France, the United Kingdom and Israel with serious consequences if they did not stop hostilities. The situation was heating up and therefore the United States demanded that its allies cease hostilities in the Middle East. Already on November 2, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution demanding an end to hostilities and the withdrawal of troops from Egyptian territory. On the morning of November 7, hostilities ceased, and on November 15 UN forces arrived in the Canal Zone. In December 1956, the United Kingdom and France withdrew their troops from Egypt, and the Israeli army left the occupied territories in the Sinai Peninsula. This ended the conflict. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to my channel and click on the bell so as not to miss new videos.